was buried beneath my shame Who could carry that kind of weight It was my tomb Till I met you I was breathing but not alive All my failures I tried to hide It was my tomb Till I met you In my elementary school, each day began with the reciting of the Pledge of Allegiance. The Apostle Peter wrote that the Christian life is also founded upon a pledge. We read in 1 Peter chapter 3, verses 18 through 22. For Christ died for sins once for all, the righteous for the unrighteous, to bring you to God. He was put to death in the body, but made alive by the Spirit through whom he also he went and preached to the spirits in prison, who disobeyed long ago when God waited patiently in the days of Noah while the ark was being built. In it only a few people, eight in all, were saved through water. And this water symbolizes baptism that now saves you also. Not the removal of dirt from the body, but the pledge of a good conscience toward God. It saves you by the resurrection of Jesus Christ, who has gone into heaven and is at God's right hand. 
Now, Peter notes that baptism serves no practical physical purpose because the cleansing we need is not physical. Instead, baptism is the time and place where we entrust our lives to Jesus. It is also a declaration that we will conform to the rule of Jesus' law, which is to love God and love people. As with Christian baptism, communion is also a pledge of allegiance. It is a weekly proclamation of the reality of Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection. Eating the bread and drinking from the cup serve no practical physical purpose, yet it anchors our faith in the reality of Jesus' sacrifice for all people, regardless of background, race, culture, or social status. By participating, we proclaim our belief that Jesus suffered, died for us to make us right before God. Let's pray. Lord God, we thank you for sending your one and only Son, Jesus, to die in our place on that cruel cross. We thank you that he paid the full price for our sins. We remember him at this communion time. We pledge allegiance to him. May we love one another, not just those who are like us, but all persons as Jesus loved us. May we give our lives for others as Jesus gave his life for us. In the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus, we pray. Amen. For I received from the Lord what I also pass on to you. The Lord Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. For whenever we drink this cup and eat this bread, we proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Well, hey, church, glad to have you here today worshiping with us, whether it's online or whether it's in person Sunday morning. It's great to be together uh, in any capacity to worship God. Uh, coming to you this morning, uh, I, I, I'm, I'm excited about the message. I'm excited about this series uh, that we're just calling Direction. Very simple, Direction. Uh, and it starts with a story. Now, I love a good story. Uh, my favorite story involves a train conductor that was imprisoned uh, because of some bad choices he made and then the difficulties that he faced there. It has so many dramatic twists and turns and, and I'd love to take the time to share this story with you, but I probably don't have time for it today. So sometime if you want to have me over, you want to come over, I'll sit and I'll tell you the story because it is a fantastic one. But I love, I love stories. I could sit around and share stories with people all day, listen to stories with people all day. Oftentimes on my way to work to the church building here, you know, I drive through Gambier and I drive through Kenyon College. And right there on the main stretch there, just past the post office, 
Uh, I see a, a group of older gentlemen sitting in front of this building almost every day, uh, drinking coffee and talking. And, and I like to assume that they're just telling stories after stories. And oftentimes I'm tempted to just like stop and like kind of like walk up and sit down and, and, and join them. But I don't wanna be too creepy. Uh, but I, I just love hearing people's stories about their life, about things they've done. Because I think the reality is in some capacity, we all have great stories. Things like, hey, let me tell you about this time I overcame something. Let me tell you about this time I learned something and my, my point of view got shifted in a major way. Let me tell you about a goal that I set and, and I, how I overcame it. Let me tell you about a mistake I made and the lesson I learned from it. Or hey, let me tell you about this stupid funny thing that I did that I can laugh at now. I was reminded of that recently uh, as I was discussing at a campfire uh, the way you know we were talking about like cheeseburgers right of all things and how we liked them cooked versus how we like steak cooked and things like that and you know for steaks and burgers I like them medium you know I, I like them just a little pink on the inside but I, but I recalled one evening with my sisters and my cousins when I was when I was in like late junior high maybe early high school and we were we were camping out and, and we started our own campfire and we decided to grill these steaks over the fire. And it wasn't a great fire, all right, but it worked. It, it got it warm and we grilled these steaks for what felt like ages. Now the fire wasn't great, it was hard to see. We didn't have a ton of other lights or anything and we finally like, okay, well, you know, th they're done, they feel warm. And so we're all sitting around this very dim fire and we're eating these steaks with our bare hands because we're camping, you know, we're really roughing it out there in our backyard. And it was so good. These steaks were so good. And we're biting into it and we're like, man, can you believe how good these steaks, they're so juicy. You know, like there's just, I have like just juice all over me from these steaks and we're just chewing into them, gnawing on them. And it was about that time that someone flipped a lantern on to look for something or, or to find something. And I will forever be horrified by the sight of all of us sitting there chewing on these steaks with blood running down our face and our hands and our arms and onto our clothes because those steaks, uh, they were not medium. They were not uh, medium rare, they, they were rare. Uh, but they were so good. So we all have stories, we all have things we've learned from that we can laugh at, that we can look at and say, man, I can't believe I did that, or wow, I've grown so much from, from that time. I think that's what makes uh, our connection with the Bible sometimes so powerful, is because we can relate to a lot of the stories about the people that we read in there, uh, people who learn from certain things, some good, some not so good. And just like them, our stories are the same way. Our stories have times where maybe we embellish a little bit to, to try to look better. Or maybe we have parts of the story that we don't really like, and so we try to gloss over it. Uh, and, and we wish it went differently. But we can connect and we can relate to those stories in the Bible because they're real, they're authentic. The ups, the downs, the good, the bad, the ugly, everything in between, uh, it's all right there. Just like our story. And the reality is in our stories and stories in the Bible in a story anyone is going to tell about something that actually happened, it's always going to come back to one thing. And that's the decisions that we make, the choices that we make. The decisions that we make right now will determine the stories that we tell later on. The choices that we make now will define a lot of things about our future. The choices and decisions we make will affect our tomorrow. So my question to you would be, how do we live a life worth telling a story about? Well, look at Hebrews 12.2. If you have your Bible or your phone, look at Hebrews 12.2. It says, let us fix our eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith. Maybe your translation says it a little bit differently. Some will say founder. Some will say the one who initiates. Some will say the one who began. My translation says the author and perfecter of our faith. Think about that. Wouldn't it be amazing to describe Jesus as your author, the founder, the initiator, the one who began, the one who's telling the story of our life? And to do that, it needs to be a story that God wants us to live. And to do that, we need to fix our eyes on him because he is the author. 
He is the leader. He is the captain. He is Christ. He needs to be the author. And so if that's going to happen, it needs to start with decisions, with choices. And specifically today, I'm going to ask everyone to make a commitment. I'm going to ask you to make a commitment to starting something. Okay, that, that's my big takeaway, is that I want you to leave today and, and know that I'm asking you to start something. Now understand, please, I'm not talking about starting a business. I'm not talking about starting a new job or writing a dream book or starting a YouTube channel or anything like that. I want to challenge everyone to make a commitment to start something small, to start a new discipline, to start some healthy habit that will affect your story later on down the road. In the book called The Power of Habit by Charles Duhigg, he contends that small disciplines, when practiced regularly, grow and snowball and build this positive momentum towards more positive disciplines. All right, in the same way, the absence of those positive disciplines builds more negative momentum towards letting other things go. So think about it this way. I wake up every day and I, I give God my first fruits. First thing I try to do is read uh, scripture from the Bible. Uh, before I check Twitter, before I check Facebook, before I check email or anything else, I like to read the Bible. And sometimes, because I'm not a morning person, okay, I don't really like mornings and I'm not ashamed to admit that, uh, sometimes uh, it's only a verse. Sometimes it's just the verse of the day to get me started. Other times I'll sit and I'll read a chapter or two uh, or more from the Bible, but I give God my first fruits. That's a discipline that I have been working and working and working at, at doing. And then I get up and because I'm feeling like, okay, like this is, this is important. Uh, I, I, I feel motivated. I go and I drink a glass of water because I want to take care of myself so I can continue to work for God. And, and then I feel better after I drink a glass of water and then I'm reminded, oh yeah, you got to take your pills, which are important to slow down a progressive disease. And I, I take my pills and I, drew my, I, I brew my cup of coffee and then uh, I, I head to work or I start working and I'm in a positive mood. I'm, I'm eternally focused because I gave God the first part of my day. And so then stuff that comes up during the day, obstacles or, or frustrations or stress or anxiety, I, I'm able to, to kind of frame that better because I started my day with a small discipline, with a small habit. And then I come home and I'm in a better mood because I was focused on God and his presence and in an eternal perspective. And I go and see Jill and I'm like, hey, how you doing? And she's like, oh, you know, she blushes a little like she does. And she's like, oh, stop it, Drew, you know, and, and we're all happy and everything's good. Okay, now think about the flip side. I wake up, I'm rushed, I'm panicked, I get in an argument on Facebook with somebody, I start retweeting stuff I shouldn't retweet, and I don't open the Bible, I don't think about those small disciplines, and then I get up, I chug my gallon of coffee, I burn my tongue, I run out the door, I honk at everyone on my way to church, because I'm running late, I'm hungry, and I'm angry all day, yep, I'm angry, right? Then I come home, and I'm snappy with Jill, I'm, I'm snappy with the kids, the dog hates me, the car breaks down, and pretty soon I'm living in a van down by the river, all because... I didn't make good choices with small disciplines. Okay, so maybe a slight exaggeration there, but you get the point. Small disciplines doubled up on other small disciplines lead to bigger disciplines. And it's going to lead to better spiritual health by starting with small things. And likewise, lack of discipline in small things is going to create more bad habits and build more negative momentum. And so this morning, I wanna show you a story where someone made a small decision. They made a small decision concerning a spiritual habit, a spiritual discipline, and it ultimately affected the direction of their life and ultimately played a huge factor in saving their life. Today, we're gonna to look at the story of Daniel and the lion's den. Now, if you know the story, you're probably somewhat familiar with it, uh, but Daniel was looked favorably upon by King Darius. King Darius selected 120 satraps. These were like governors to rule the territory. And then he picked three men out to be over the 120. Daniel was one of the three. He stood out because of his integrity, his leadership skills. And the king said, I want to put Daniel in charge of everyone. Now, as you can imagine, because of human nature, the other people were jealous. They were envious, and they said, we got to put a stop to Daniel. He, he's a teacher's pet. we got to stop him. And so that's where our story picks up. Daniel chapter 6, verses 4 and 5. It says, at this, the administrators and the satraps tried to find grounds for charges against Daniel in his conduct, in his conduct of government affairs, but they were unable to do so. 
So stop right there. What were they doing? They were looking for a little dirt. They're looking to dig some trash up, to find a reason to make charges, to bring charges against this guy, but they couldn't do it. Imagine that, a government official that is scandal-free, that hasn't said stuff that's embarrassing, that hasn't been involved in, in, uh, in you know, bribes or anything like that. And, and, and here he is. Like they, they found a government official like that. It goes on to say they could find no corruption in him because he was trustworthy and neither corrupt nor negligent. Why was he trustworthy and neither corrupt nor negligent? Well, I'm glad you asked, and I'll tell you here in just a moment. But let's continue reading on here. It says, finally, these men said, we will never find any basis for charges against this man, Daniel, unless it has something to do with the law of his God. So they came up with this elaborate plan. And you can read all the details, but basically they went to the king and said, hey, king, we've got a great idea. Wouldn't it be awesome if for the next 30 days, no one would be allowed to pray to anyone or any God except for you, king? So they, they appeal to his sense of pride, his sense of power. And, and, this, and they say, well, you know, and, and if anyone prays to anyone other than you, you should throw them in a lion's den. And the king, you know, who, who kind of liked, you know, his, his pride being built up like that, was like, you know what, that sounds pretty cool to me. Let's make a law. No one prays to anyone but me. And if they do, they're thrown into a lion's den. Okay, so why was Daniel looked upon so favorably? Why was he a man of integrity? Why was he put in a position of leadership? Why was there no corruption found in him? Why did God show favor upon Daniel on the lion's den and deliver him from the mouth of the hungry, hungry cats? Well, I'll show you why. Because years ago, Daniel made a decision to start doing something that made him into a man of integrity that made him into the man that he became. He started a spiritual discipline that affected his future in a big way. He made a small choice to start doing something years earlier that ultimately played a factor in saving his life. I want you to look at Daniel chapter 6 verse 10 to see what that was. Daniel chapter 6 verse 10 says, Now when Daniel learned that the decree had been published, he went home to his upstairs room where the windows opened towards Jerusalem. Three times a day, he got down on his knees and prayed, giving thanks to his God, just as he had done before. Just as he had done before. Think about this. Who knows for how long? Okay, I would say certainly months, perhaps years, probably even longer than that. Three times a day, Daniel stopped whatever he was doing, made an appointment to worship and to talk to the one true king. Talk to God. He knelt down before God, aligned his heart to God over three times a day, worshiping him, praying that God's will be done in his life. So you can ask yourself, why was he successful? Why was he promoted? Why was he a man of integrity? Why was he looked upon favorably? Why did he rise in influence? Well, because he made a decision a long time ago to start three times a day praying to God. At some point, he made the decision to start doing that, and it transformed his story and the story that God would tell through him. See, the decisions that we make now will determine the stories that we tell down the road. And so I want to pose to you two questions. The first question is very simple, but I want you to ask yourself this question. What does God want you to want? Not what do you want, what does God want you to want? Another way to phrase it would be like this. Five years from now, what is the story that God wants to tell about your life? Not what is the story you want to tell, but five years from now, what is the story God wants to tell about your life? hundred years from now, what is the story God wants to tell about your life? What story does God want you to tell? What does God want you to want? I would imagine if you're really honest and you sit back and you think about that, you could probably say, hey, you know what, there's a couple areas in my life where it's not where it should be, where I've just been coasting through. I've just been doing what I have to do to get by. This, this, this chapter in life that I'm in right now is not going to end well unless I make some changes. This chapter, this season of life is not a story that I want told. Think about it. What story does God want you to tell? What does he want you to to want. Maybe it's getting out of debt, cutting up the credit card, stop living paycheck to paycheck, have more margin in your budget, 
so that way the stress of financial matters isn't a, isn't playing in to uh, so many other things. Baby, he wants you to start taking care of your body. Start walking, working out, eating better so that you can serve God better. I would say that's the biggest journey I'm on. Uh, since last June, I've lost 70 pounds. Uh, and, I, and I'm working and struggling and trying to do my best every single day so that I can serve God better, so that I can serve him longer. The choices that I'm making now will affect the stories I can tell in the future. Maybe for you, it's just to start by keeping work at work and be present when you're home. Put boundaries around your home, around your life. Maybe for you, it's a discipline of just reading the Bible every day. Start by reading the verse of the day. Read one verse a day. It'll take 15 seconds. You actually can get a push notification on your phone that will pop up. You don't even have to go look for it. They'll put it right there in front of your face. Take 15 seconds a day and see what God can do with 15 seconds. Maybe it's starting the discipline of praying more. Track your prayers. Pray regularly. Pray differently. Pray dangerously like we've talked about. I don't know what it is for you, but I have a feeling if you build off of last week's message where we talked about self-examination over self-justification, and, 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 you, and you take that message to heart, and, and, and you look at your life, there are probably things in your life that will jump out to you like things have jumped out to me in my life. But I want to bring the application question to you, and that's this. Based on what God wants you to want, based on what we looked at very quickly with the story of Daniel and how he started something and how it affected his story later on, I want you to answer this question. What do you need to start? What do you need to start? What do you need to start doing to tell the story that God wants you to tell? What do you need to start doing to want what God wants you to want? What do you need to, what do you need to start to live a story that's worth telling five years from now, 20 years from now? And here's the key. What I want you to do is I want you to pick one thing and only one thing. Because the temptation for a lot of us is to pick seven or eight or nine things, right? It's like, okay, I need to lose all this weight and I need to start doing this and I need to start doing that and I need to start doing this and I need to do it all right now. And the reality is if we have that many things and we try to do that many things right now, we won't do any of them. We won't do one. So I want you to pick one. I want you to pick something small and I want you to commit to it. Pray and ask God to reveal, what do you want me to want? Help, help me to set my heart to the same desires as your heart, God. What story do you want me to tell? What discipline do I need to start so I can tell a better story in the future? The decisions that we make today will determine the stories that we tell tomorrow. The decisions that we make today will determine how much we're able to do for God. So we can see in, this, in, in Daniel's uh, life all these small disciplines that made a big change for him. And you're probably familiar with the story, but, but spoiler alert, he's thrown into the, lo the lion's den and, and he, he, he's not devoured by the lions. Okay, you, you probably knew that. If you didn't, I'm sorry, I just ruined the story for you, but you can go on and, and keep reading it. He's thrown in the lion's den, he's left for dead, but the lions do not devour him. And you know what it's attested to? It's not just like that it was some really weird breed of lions. They weren't pacifists. It wasn't Daniel's amazing survival skills or fighting skills or his climbing ability or that, you know, maybe, you know, he had tainted me or something, you know, like it wasn't anything like that. It was his trust in God. Daniel 6, 20, 6 23 tells us that when Daniel was lifted from the den, no wound was found on him because he had trusted in his God. The small choices that we make now can determine so much about our future. So I just want to challenge you. I want to encourage you to examine your life and, and ask yourself, what story does God want you to tell with your life? And what do you need to start to make that happen?